In this video, I'm going to share with you seven things that have shocked me about living in the UK. I'm an American who has traveled to Britain more than 20 times, and sometimes I've stayed here for two or three weeks at a time. But this is my first time living in my own home and staying for months at a time. So I wanted to share with you some things that I've noticed this time around that I just thought were funny, not better or worse compared to the US, but just things that are maybe a little bit more quirky and obscure that I found funny. But first, let me introduce myself to those of you who are new here. My name is Dara, and I created Magenta Otter Travels as a place where Brits and Anglophiles can get together and talk about British stuff. So whether you live in Britain or you just love Britain, I hope that you join the conversation. So now I'll get into the seven things that I think are a little bit funny about living in the UK from my perspective as an American. The first is the weather. Like a Brit, I'm gonna start by talking about the weather, but not just the fact that it rains a lot or it's cold or that. What I found most surprising this time living here and just watching the Apple News updates on my phone is the weather headlines are so funny because they're always so extreme. It's always scorching hot temperatures will incinerate Britain this weekend. The weather is just always this big dramatic headline. I knew Brits like to talk about the weather. I just wasn't expecting it to be so melodramatic in the news headlines all the time. The other thing is I knew that the weather was changeable and Brits certainly like people in the US in several places I've lived have all said some version of the saying, if you don't like the weather, wait 10 minutes and it'll change. And that's definitely true. The weather here is very changeable. But what surprised me is that the weather forecast changes all the time for like tomorrow. So as a YouTuber, I'm trying to see when should we go visit this castle? When should we go visit this Cotswold village? When should I go do a photo shoot? And I was trying to plan around when it wouldn't rain, when it might be a little bit sunny. And that would change constantly. In the course of one day, I would check the weather forecast for the next day and the day after, and it would change. Like, I swear, every 20 minutes, the forecast for tomorrow would change. <laughs> and it's just not like that in the US. You can see a long range forecast of which days are gonna be hot and sunny and which days might be overcast or rainy. And it doesn't change that dramatically over time. Now, of course, when you get to that day, the weather might be different, but yeah, just not as much as here. The weather forecasts are kind of useless because they're always super wrong and changing constantly. The second thing is doors. This is obscure. I haven't really heard anyone else talk about this. But as an American, a middle-aged American, who her whole life is used to when I'm inside a commercial building, a restaurant, a store, whatever, and I go to exit, you push the door open. That's just what you do. And conversely, when you're entering a place of business, you pull the door to open it. And this is really a fire safety thing. You know, back over a hundred years ago, they figured out that in a crowded theater, if someone yelled fire and everyone's pushing toward the exit, if the door opens in, you've got a mob of hysterical people now trapped inside this building, unable to get out. So they instituted a regulation that all exit doors had to open out. So I'm just used to exit doors always open out. So like a big dummy, every single time I go to enter a store or a bank or whatever, I am forever pulling the door open, even though there's usually a sign on it that says push. So I just think that is kind of funny that British doors don't open out. And I'm wondering if maybe that'll change someday. I don't think there's any hope of me figuring out that I need to just read what the sign says on the door and do what it says. The second thing is doors on people's homes. I find this very strange because in the US, as far as I can recall, all of our door handles going into someone's house, the handle is a round waist hip height, like kind of where your hand is when you go to enter the door. Whereas in Britain, 
sometimes doorknobs <laughs> seem like they're up really high, like where your face is. And I'm kind of a tall human. So if they're really high up for me, for quite petite people, they must be incredibly high. And I'm like, I, I, that seems a little illogical to me too. Like just physics, wouldn't it make more sense for the door handle to not be up really high <laughs> to try? And, and also sometimes they're in the middle of the door. So kind of, you know, left or right, they're in the middle of the door and up high, like, how do you open a door? And I don't know, someone explain that to me. If you think that's logical, please explain that to me because that just seems a little bit strange. Next up is post offices. And honestly, this is my favorite one of the seven. So in the US, post offices are just kind of boring. It's where you go to post a letter or buy stamps or mail a package somewhere. But in the UK, post offices have all these other things they do and they're in interesting places. So in a small village, the post office can be kind of the, the main shop, the main store in town, kind of the, as Americans would think of the general store back in the old wild west where a small town would have like just one store in the middle of town that sold all the things you needed. That's kind of how sometimes post offices are in small English villages. And I live in Cheltenham, which is not a village, it's a large town. I kind of see it as a small city. We have a bunch of post offices around town. My favorite post office, I drove by and I just cracked up because the sign was saying all the services that you can get. And I'm used to that, you know, post offices will do currency exchange and various things but this post office sold sandwiches. I mean, y'all, I just found that very funny that you could go to the post office and buy a sandwich. I have never seen that in the US. Speaking of sandwiches, point number four is grated cheese. Now, some of you might be new to my channel, but it just is not a Magenta Otter Travels video if I don't talk about food and specifically find some way to work in a mention of cheese. But honestly, this cheese thing, when it comes to sandwiches, is very funny to me. I love cheese and pickle sandwiches. It's my favorite sandwich. And if you don't know what that is, I've got other videos that talk about that. So I won't belabor that point now. But what I find so strange is that when I make a cheese and pickle sandwich at home, I use my Branston pickle and a slice of cheese. Whereas if you are buying a sandwich at a store or restaurant or maybe even the post office, the cheese is grated, grated cheese in a sandwich, you know, a triangular shaped half sandwich. And so what happens is you go to pick it up and the cheese kind of falls out. And I'm thinking, why y'all gotta do that? Why don't you just use a slice of cheese? It's not gonna fall out as easy. So again, if there's some logical reason why you Brits are doing that, please explain it to me. I'd honestly like to know because it just doesn't make sense to me. It is true that Brits butter their bread when making a sandwich much, much more often than Americans. Americans don't put butter on sandwiches as much. We're more kind of mayonnaise mustard folk. So I don't know, maybe the butter is supposed to glue down all those little grated cheese bits, I just know they fall out in my own personal experience. So please explain that to me. The next shocking thing to me is measuring liquid. Now I did know from my frequent visits here that Brits measure things in metric in general. And I also knew that when you're cooking, you usually need to use a scale to measure things like in grams. I also knew like if you go to buy gas at a petrol station, I believe it's measured in liters. I've been coming here for so many decades. I think at one point it was measured in gallons. And I remember my husband saying that the gallons were different. And I guess I just never thought that through enough that if the gallons are different, that would mean the cups are different. So when I started attempting here in my home to cook things and to follow recipes, I was shocked, truly shocked to discover that when measuring liquids, a cup is not eight ounces. I mean, that blew my mind. So what does it have here? A cup 
also known as half a pint. That's what it says on the Pyrex measuring cup. That coma would just say a cup. But a cup is 10 ounces. And in the US, it's eight ounces. This explains why I have trouble following recipes. <laughs> and while I'm here, I've just decided I have to only follow British recipes because trying to make all the conversions between American and British stuff, I just end up messing things up a lot. Okay, let's talk about streets. One thing I've noticed now that we have been living here is that the streets are so rarely in a grid pattern. And I'm sure that's just due to the age of the towns and how long they've been around. But in the US, there's frequently an overall grid pattern to how a city or town is laid out and the streets are kind of at 90 degree angles to each other. But here, I don't do the driving. My husband does the driving because no one likes the way I drive here. So as I'm watching my husband navigate around here, just overwhelmed with the complexity of it all and the roundabouts and especially in large towns like this where there's one-way streets and the roundabouts and the streets are all going off in higgledy-piggledy directions. I'm just like, wow, this is, this is really hard to navigate and to find your way from point A to point B. So thank goodness for GPS, sat-nav, navigation. And my seventh point is also related to driving. Now, yeah, I know the streets are narrow. I learned that a long time ago. That's an old culture shock for me, having to drive around the super narrow country roads with hedgerows on both sides and no visibility. That's definitely shocking, but that's not a new culture shock. What really I've noticed more recently is just the parking, the fact that you will go to a town on the high street, the main street, the busy thoroughfare through the middle of town, which is a relatively narrow road, two lanes of opposing traffic, and one of the lanes will be taken up by parked cars. You would not see that in the US. That would not be okay. <laughs> But it's normal here, and I know why, is because the towns and villages are so old, there just is not adequate parking. So people are desperate to park, and so they make parking spaces there. The people are not parked illegally there. There's actually markings for parking spots. But the fact that you have to give up one of your lanes of traffic on the main street through town to an American just is a little shocking. Because what that means is, as you're driving through town, everyone's doing this little dance of weaving in and out <laughs> between parked cars to let each other go. And uh, yeah, it can be challenging. But I'll tell you what, all of these things are so worth it because I absolutely love living here. And it's been great exploring Britain this summer. And we've had so many wonderful adventures. And I hope that you subscribe and click on that little bell so that you can be notified when our new videos come out. I will be posting lots of videos in the coming months about cultural observations as well as all of our travels. And so I hope you join me for it. Let me know what you think about my culture shocks. Tell me what you agree or disagree with. But most of all, thanks so much for watching and do something good in the world today.